Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Hussein Mahadi, and um, I'm going to be a moderator for today's session on blockchain, NFT, and metaverse and mentorship and internship program on that Gypsy. And our topic for today is blockchain. Um, our mentors, we have two mentors for today, and I'm very happy to um, welcome the first mentor on board. And also, I can see um, our mentees are also joining the session. So um, we should just give them a few minutes to join the session. I'm also making an announcement on the group to make sure everybody is coming online immediately. Good morning, Ms. Buki Ogunsaki and Cynthia Igor. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's just the three of us. I don't know. We can't start. So I think we should just, I'm sending a message across. I'm trying to call the group. Okay, I can see we have um, two, two new mentees on board. Thank you for joining us. Um, although you joined late, so we've already started. We are like, trying to give um, those late mentees some time before we start the program. So let's wait if we can get another two mentees before we start properly. Um, good morning, everybody, once again. Um, I hope you can hear, you can all hear me and um, I hope I'm audible enough. Okay, um, we are all encouraged to put on our videos. Um, as we all know, the, the session today is being live streamed on YouTube. 
and um, other social media platform. And our topic for today is blockchain. And our mentors for today are Barista Buki Ogosaki and uh, Miss Sarah Zade. Um, I welcome all you, all everybody, our mentees and our mentors on the Zoom meeting today and on this topic for today. Um, I'm Hussein once again, and I will be moderating this session today. Quickly, I will be making some announcement and telling us how um, what the program is all about before we um, jump into presentations and um, talks from our mentors for today. So the first um, thing I'm going to put on my screen is about the program. I'm going to be telling us about the program for those of us joining us today and for those of us um, just joining for the first time. So Gypsy Mentorship and Internship Program is a quarterly program for young students and um, young professionals across Africa. Mentees are afforded the opportunity to access valuable advice, training, network, mentorship, internship, discussion forums, industry updates, and resource materials from experienced mentors. The program seeks to encourage continuous training, development, and evolution in Africa and around the world. Um, you can search on YouTube and Facebook for our, some of our videos to also know what the program is all about. Hashtag Gypsy MIP. So some of the objectives of the programs are to provide easy access to quality, professional guidance, training, and resource materials for students and young professionals in Africa to facilitate dialogue um, and network among experienced and less experienced practitioners and stakeholders to transform mentees into mentors and leaders for the next generation and to facilitate further mentorship, internships, scholarship, and job placements for the mentees. So that's what. Um, the program is basically all about. I can see someone is raising their hand on the call. I don't know what you want to um share with us by raising your hand. Apple Omose. Okay. I'll just move on to the next announcement for today, which is um the registration for the next quarter of the program that we are currently having is still ongoing. Um, areas which um, we offer are uh, intellectual property, artificial intelligence, um, health tech and law, fintech, um, this energy, um, blockchain, NFTs and metaverse, the energy industry and um, patent drafting. Those are the areas that we offer and you all are to be aware that um, there is a 30 minute one on one session available for everybody who is interested on in talk, having a one-on-one -on -one session with any of the gypsy mentors. So that will be all for the um, announcements. So I'll be sharing um, our mentors profile for today to us. So we know the mentors that we are having on the call today. Um, our first mentor is a profound mentor. We had her here with us last week and she's also here to um, lecture us on the topic for today, which is blockchain. So kindly hold on as I share my screen immediately. Okay. Barrister Buki. Barrister Buki um, Ogunsaki is the principal and head Stoshi thinker at BBO solicitors. She is an emerging tech lawyer, primarily working with clients in emerging technology areas such as NFTs, metaverse, crypto, blockchain, AI, as well as cybersecurity and data privacy. Buki is highly sorted after by her clients due to her um, 17 plus years additional experience in strategy and projects management. Buki is also currently a consultant with Estella Inc and the Lagos Business School, and volunteers as director of strategy at E4E. She is a smart contract research fellow and a Cleros Decentralized Justice Fellow. She is also a certified NFT expert from the Blockchain Council, a certified international privacy professional, a member of the Nigerian Bar Association and the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Thank you very much for joining us today, Ms. Um, Boki. 
Ogunsaki. And our next mentor for today is Sarah, Miss Sarah Zade. Sarah Zade is an attorney at Nutadolti in the technology group and the Benelux Data Protection Team and specializes in IT privacy and data protection law. Sarah advises and assists national and international clients on privacy governance, IT agreements and disputes, cybersecurity, privacy supervision and regulation in the healthcare sector and the legal aspect of emerging technologies such as blockchain, artificial intelligence and the metaverse. Sarah is frequently invited as a guest speaker at seminars and conferences, including the next Web International Tech Conference, the Road Business University, and the Dutch National News Radio. She also um, she also regulates she also regularly publishes articles and blogs. Sarah studied at Linden University, Philosophy of Law, um, the University of Amsterdam, Health Law. Um, the London School of Economics and Political Science, Cyber Law, and in 2020, she completed the Oxford Artificial Intelligence Program at the University of Oxford. Thank you very much for joining us today, Ms. Sarah Mzade. Um, we'll be jumping on to, um, I'm listening to our mentors for today. I can see we have um, Ms. Buki Ogunsaki on the call. I don't know if you have um sarah yet on the call will be waiting for her um kindly note that you are all advised to put on your videos and the session today is interactive so you are all advised to engage with the mentors thank you very much i'll be calling on miss buki ogosaki to take the floor right now yeah thank you so much uh could you wait for me to get into the office because i'm actually on the move i sent juliana a message so i think we okay. can start with these presentations thank you okay we can start with the mentees presentation okay um the mentees presentation please um i hope you are ready to start your presentation who is the presenter um you can unmute yourself you can share your slide with us And please, who is the um, presenter for the group? I'm sorry, the presenter for the group. Okay, thank you very almost. much. What is your name, please? Apofure Paul Almost. Okay. okay, thank you very much for joining us. Um, you can um, share your slide. Um, slide. The slide, actually the slide, I'm not too good with the slide but one of our group members says she will be sharing the slide so that i can go on with the presentation okay is she on the call i guess so okay yes uh, let me share so you present all right All right, so you can. Hello. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Good morning to the class. Good morning to the mentors. Good morning to Gypsy. My name is uh, Kofuri Paul Omos. Yeah. Today, being the week two, I'll be the one presenting. Our topic is blockchain technology and our contents are we'll be looking at smart contract that ethereum cryptography bitcoin and blockchain securities which are the top five challenges for implementing blockchain technology so initially i'll be starting with 
smart contracts. Basically, smart contracts are a form of self-executing form of contract if that is quite different from the traditional contract that we know. A contract legally is between two parties or more persons. But a smart contract is a program that has been where the terms between the parties, maybe the buyers and the sellers are encrypted in codes that are encrypted in a form of block in codes on blockchain that can run when predictions are met. What we consider a predetermined condition can be a condition between where the terms of a contract between buyers and sellers are written down and these, these conditions are put on code in a form of smart contract on blockchains. And when those conditions are met, it automatically executes. It automatically executes without a third party or intermediary in such kind of transaction. So, see, so basically, smart contract simplifies business and trade between persons, parties that can be anonymous and post dominos that's parties that you can identify and also parties that you cannot identify so block uh, smart every smart contract is can be broken down into the types of as the features of a smart contract we usually have properties that are static and variables St static and variables are data information of data <laughs> that can be static or variable that it can likely change. Then we have also the logic. The logic is the, is the terms. These are the terms that if A and B happens, then C is the result. That is A brings money and B collects a certain amount of money. A product or services can be affected. That may be the logic between the two parties. So that is the second part of every smart contract it usually has logic behind same and also the third form is a, is a ledger a ledger a form of record keeping data of what the transaction transpired so every smart contract must compose of these properties logic and ledger so smart contracts are usually deployed on blockchain technology and most likely it is the interim tech uh, blockchain that has been most simplified and very effective for smart contracts and if you have to deploy a smart contract in an ethereum you must have ether ether is the native tokens is the, like the currency for every transaction that you carry out on the ethereum blockchain so most of the applications on Ethereum are powered by smart contracts. And you usually have a balance that is put on an Ethereum account and the user account can interact with such smart contract account. And once the transaction is disclosed, is lodged, then I think it is, when it's lodged, then it is completed. An example of a smart contract can be like a vending machine, our POS or a junk box machine where you put in your card, you state a particular amount of money that you need, a particular of product that you need, and you click and the machine reads and see where the information or data are same and it gives you the product, maybe a Coke, a music, or in the form of jukebox. So that's possibly how a smart contract runs in a blockchain network. So it can do basically anything that a computer program can do. It can track, it can record, it can carry out any manner of transaction. So secondly, we'll be looking at DAP. DAP is a form of program, a, a digital app that runs also on blockchain. Generally, it's supposed to be a peer-to-peer -peer network of computers. Its, it's, its functions should be paired to pair network of computers. 
these applications they are usually decentralized and a single, a single authority like a central body cannot control cannot manage such applications so it's usually open to everybody so far you have a computer network and you can access say an example of a digital application includes they include amongst they include chain Um, I can't hear um, Akufuri. Can we all hear him? Digital app like Chainlink, and most of us know there. The notifications are digitally reduced because the time also is reduced. There's no wastage of time, and it makes it makes it creates job. It creates jobs because a lot of app. I've been able to create jobs and also promote transactions where a party, the reduction of theft, the reduction of fraud, and likely dishonest acts are reduced to the barest ma maximum by digital app. Thirdly, we'll be looking at Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a form of digital money that is expected to act as money in the real world. Initially, it was designed and released based on based on peer-to-peer -peer payment method, but in the long run, it started the value started increasing. The usage of Bitcoin started growing, and there is a great competition for it from other blockchains and cryptocurrencies. Was initially created by Satoshi Nakamoto. Bitcoin can be created by mining and its usage has grown over time. People can mine Bitcoin, the pool of mine. And as you can either mine, it is also open to pool of miners. I think there's a particular machine called this ASIC, the ASIC, basic, the ASIC, the app specific integrated, app specific integrated circuit machine. So usually we have hardware and software that can mine Bitcoin and transactions basically. Sorry. Sorry. Um. on Bitcoin are copied on blocks, blocks and they are encrypted encrypted and verified by validators in this Bitcoin network. So actually any transaction with the use of the Bitcoin eliminates the road of third parties, just like also other blockchain network because transaction between the people are, is a common, a public ledger record that is open to anybody. You can get it based on broadcast and it's shared from node to node. And distributed along the chain. Economic implementation and economic implication of bitcoins. Yes, the economic implication of bitcoins is that there's a shift, there's a change in the way people do business now, especially when bitcoin has become a valuable commodity, apart from being just money form it has not been adopted as a form of investment too people now buy it and keep it with the mindset that it will increase in value and maybe they may sell off so bitcoin has become a strong meme now especially in the stock market investors can slide in and use bitcoin for their transaction and as the economic changes the description of the covid 19 especially where monies were not, where people were not allowed social interaction to exchange money, Bitcoin was used. So since that adoption of Bitcoin has grown, especially in the emerging tech market, to be one of the biggest, most used 
blocks uh, cryptocurrencies in, in the global industry. Fourthly, we'll be looking at Ethereum. Ethereum, as the world pronounces, is the second biggest cryptocurrency also. Ethereum is a blockchain-based software platform that can be used to send and receive value globally. Just like blockchain, it has its own native currency to be known as ETA. So when you developers also use Ethereum to run decentralized applications and they issue cryptos, such as Ethereum tokens. And Ethereum can be used in a wider variety of applications, unlike Bitcoin. It's, it's, it can execute smart contracts, unlike Bitcoin that cannot execute smart contracts. So the transaction records are usually immutable, verified, and secured, and distributed across the network, open, very open, like Bitcoin. Once you have an access to a computer network, you can usually use the Ethereum and create an account and have ETA to fund your transaction, like smart contracts. So there are a lot of examples of technologies that has been run on the platform, which includes decentralized finance, financial transaction like borrowing, lending, insurance, investment. Those are decentralized, those are decentralized finances. Those transactions actually exist on Ethereum platform. But they cannot exist on Bitcoin. And also this in the in new areas of non-fungitable tokens and games where smart contracts can also apply on the platform. So since 2020 September, the Ethereum, the Ethereum uh, blockchain platform transformed, transformed to a greater extent is that the, the mining of the Ethereum has really changed unlike before where they have to mine, you have to pass through special, specialized kind of technology, technical, technical mine has reduced. So you can have the proof of stake where you can stake your ETA or you can use it or if you are found not to, you are found to violate the terms of the network, you can also lose your stake of ETA. So when they now have validators, that can also earn rewards, that can earn rewards to validate transactions, smart contracts on Ethereum network, just as we have validated for Bitcoin, the miners that validate transactions, and those who also have for the Ethereum network. The economic implication also is a shift of income generation. A lot of centralized finances has been taken on the interior network and there's a lot of that's going on online to the use of these interior networks. So it generally brings a lot of income from online, online like data scientists and a lot of developers and coders and this may be. So there's also a change in the ETA issuance which was discussed earlier and the barrier to participation has really reduced. It's more or less open now to the public. Firstly, we'll be looking at cryptography. Cryptography, what actually is cryptography? So what cryptography is just like the art of... Um, Apophile, please kindly be more audible. Cryptography, cryptography. Cryptography is like the art of keeping information secure. Okay secure that unintended users cannot understand the form is the art of keeping information in a secure form where the where unintended users may not be able to understand the form we have a cryptography in the sense that plain tests are usually plain tests are usually encrypted and uh, and encrypted into a form that is known as a cipher test cipher test just the data if you have a data and you want to protect say to be secured from third parties having the knowledge of it in the digital world 
you can use cryptography. The plain text represents the data that ought to be protected during this transmission, and it passes through the form of encryption algorithm, the mathematical process, where cipher tests, where every, where, where every plain text is given a, an encryption key and replaced with cipher test. And cipher test is the product of the encryption algorithm. That is what has passed through the encryption algorithm process. The cipher test. The cipher test is the encrypted data that comes out from the source system. So we have two types of crypto system: the symmetric key encryption, which which connotes that you use the same keys, the same keys to decrypt and also the same keys to encrypt and decrypt. When you use the same keys to encrypt and decrypt, that is a type of crypto system that is called symmetric key encryption. Examples are, I think, IDEA, IDEA and others. So we have another form called asymmetric key encryption. When you use different keys to encrypt and decrypt the data, it is such that that kind of a crypto system is called asymmetric key encryption. This day we'll be looking at blockchain security. Blockchain security. Blockchain security is just the security, the risk management involved in a blockchain network, which is usually protected as in the form of cyber security, cyber security framework, the governance of data how the rules governing how a data can be protected, shared, or distributed along the blockchain <clears throat> network. So usually the blockchain security runs with the cybersecurity framework. And this is very necessary, especially in order to reduce the risks of fraud, theft, third party inclusion, like malware, Trojan horses, and other form of compromises. <laughs> Uh, also, it's also security controls can be defined through three steps. In every security control measures in the blockchain security, you have to ensure that the enforced security controls are unique to blockchain. Blockchain security controls are of a nature that is unique, quite different from the conventional security control. Also, you have the conventional security control in addition. So that this is where compact, comp this is where protected, and it's also enforced business controls for blockchain security. Conclusively, this the every every blockchain security system must have these features. It must have to maintain security and privacy of data. Also, the energy consumption in terms of sustainability is also an issue. A challenge to the blockchain security, the number of energy that will be, you know, energy that required to capture out a full scale blockchain security on the blockchain network is quite high. Then it also has issues of low scalability and low interoperability. And normally the workforce needed to do a complete blockchain security. Yeah. It's actually not, it's not in the high now, it's very low because a lot of people don't have this knowledge of blockchain security. This is an emerging field and it's still growing. So this is the end of my presentation. I'll present our group members who compiled the presentation. Uh, Kafo, Chinelo, I myself, I prefer Polomose, the boss in this is all for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Apofure Omose, for that um, detailed, um, comprehensive um, presentation on behalf of your group. Um, I think you touched um, a lot of subjects ranging from smart contracts, the art material, cryptography, Bitcoin, and then blockchain security. And I think you did a very 
a very good job to the presentation. Um, thank you very much. And I'll leave it to our mentors to also comment and also give us their presentation. I think we are still going back to Ms. Buki Ogunsaki. She's still on the call with us. I don't know if she's available now. Hello, Ms. Buki, are you on the call? Hi, yes, I'm actually on the call. Okay, thank you very much. Um, are you still on the road? No, I'm in the office now, so mm -hmm. I can actually. One second. Okay, so how much time do I have? Um, I think let's say you have you, you initially had 15 minutes to um talk and also five minutes to comment on the, the presentation. So you have 20 minutes. Okay. And our second presenter would have how long? Um she's not with us yet, so I don't know. Okay. She's she's also supposed to be having the same time. Okay. All right, so let me attempt to share my screen. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am, you can see your screen. All right, so I'm just going to continue from my previous presentation I, and cover some of the aspects that we touched today. I would also like to first comment on the presentation that was done. It was actually quite um, covered a lot of topics. The group covered a lot of topics. Um, it's not easy to cover such a range of topics within a short time, but you guys were able to do that, which is awesome. Um, so I just want to touch on some aspects. I know last week I took DAPS as well, and he mentioned decentralized applications. So we've taken this slide last week. Um, he also went through Ethereum, and I just want to use this slide to emphasize Okay. So um, last week I talked about smart contracts as well, and I know that you guys touched on that as well. I also mentioned how smart contracts work. And so smart contracts could actually work on any um, platform, not just the Ethereum network. Um, and then we also touched on NFTs, the metaverse. Um, this is why I think I stopped last week. So when talking about blockchain, NFTs, DeFi, or what other aspects um, it is of blockchain, we need to talk about the importance of the technology. We've mentioned that the technology is immutable, it's secure, transparent, and it actually does give faster access to most 
those that have access to the internet. There's also traceability with uh, blockchain technology. And it has several use cases. So we can use blockchain for supply chain management, securing medical records, any kind of records, really, whether it's health records, music records, whatever kind of records, educational records, you know, whatever record is, because it's a decentralized ledger technology, it actually does store the information in a secure way. There also, we have to also speak about the types of blockchain, which I'm not sure you touched on. So there's a uh, public, private, and hybrid. Um, mostly public and private, because you can have a public blockchain where everybody has access to the information. Yeah, I don't even have my video on, sorry. Yes, so you can have um, public blockchain that everybody has access to, and then the blockchain could also be private. So private organizations can actually have uh, private blockchains where they have information that is not open to the public. And it's a very important aspect of the blockchain because most people know just the public part of the blockchain, whereas you could actually have it private as well. Also, it could be hybrid. So you could actually have a blockchain that parts of it is public and the remainder aspect of it is, uh, is private. So you have a combination of both uh, public aspects and the private access. And obviously for the private access, we've talked about cryptography, we've talked about um, symmetric and asymmetric um, technology or cryptography. So it will be access so those that have um, uh, more access who have access to the private aspect of the blockchain, whereas those um, that don't need any necessary access will just have access to the public aspect of um, the blockchain. And so we find examples with CBDCs where uh, different countries and nations are having their CBDCs as hybrid, where parts of it is public, parts of it is private. And like I mentioned, the private organizations are building their own um, blockchain um, infrastructure, you know, where it's only probably their staff uh, management that have access, you know, to the blockchain. So that's a very important aspect of blockchain. And we also mentioned non-fungible tokens where um, uh, they're like digital deeds of ownership and it shows ownership of digital assets on the blockchain. There are different types of tokens I'm not sure we can go into that. There's ERC-20, which is a fungible. We have ERC-721, um, which is non-fungible tokens. And then we have ERC-1155 tokens, which are like semi-fungible tokens. There are many new ones as well, which you know, we can read up on later, but we know that the different types um, of tokens um, usually use these standards, which we can read about. Then we have decentralized finance, which is payments, trading, lending, derivatives, and all of these other aspects of traditional finance, but is on um, the blockchain or they're using decentralized apps, dApps, to actually um, carry out their transactions. So like we were talking about the impacts of blockchain, um, here we see, uh, you know, the impacts of XR technology and XR, you know, is a mixture of AR and VR and MR. Um, so we see Cambridge consultants in Boston, Massachusetts, you know, using AR technology glasses, you know, to allow surgeons see the insides of the, the person's um, body. And also we mentioned um, use of blockchain for supply chain technology. So we can reduce counterfeiting of drugs through supply chain management. So you could actually trace back um, the drugs or medicines and find out where exactly they're from. So you are able to tell if it's actually original or from the original producers or what producer produced the medicines um, or the drugs that are available. So we see that all this is available in real time um, for payments tracking and also identity authentication as well. So you can actually see those who have had access to that particular medicine. You can see the hospitals that have had uh, particular access. You can see the manufacturer's information where the ma manufacturer got the um, raw materials to make the products. All of this information is actually 
in the medicine um, trail. So, and you, you can't go back and change that information. So manufacturers can't go in there because it's a blockchain to change information. The information is just there and is available for people to see. So it's a very um, good um, source or use case for reduction of counterfeiting. Um, I mentioned medical records as well earlier. You know, you can have access to medical records in a faster way, in a secure way. And um, any data management can actually be handled and stored on blockchain. But obviously, we know that there are privacy issues with this. So what many people do is that, um, or are doing right now for compliance and for standards, is that some aspects of the information is actually stored off-chain. So it's um, information that's able to be changed. But then the roots or base information is actually stored on the blockchain so that it's easier. Um, I also wanted to touch on some legal issues as well, uh, since I'm a lawyer. So um, obviously there's lack of um, regulatory requirements. We have very strict old regulations. You know, the regulators don't really understand the new emerging technologies, which is an issue. I mentioned privacy law as well. Um, there are privacy issues because right now, because of GDPR, NDPR, we have to be very careful with <clears throat> the collection of information, the use, and the processing of the data of many people, especially when it comes to sensitive um, information. We can't just have sensitive information online, and we have to control how people who have access to sensitive information, how they use this information. Again, we have cybersecurity laws, um, regulation of cyberspace and cybercrime. It's very important when we have um, anything that has to do with the web, whether it's web two or web three, cybersecurity laws are very important. We need to secure information that is online. There are also copyright laws uh, governing ownership, especially creative works, any kind of work that is online. And now we know that many um, assets are being converted to digital assets. Um, some, that's another aspect again, some assets are strictly digital while some are strictly physical, but then some are digital, meaning that they have com some components of the assets in physical and other aspects in digital. Um, so we, we have a new class uh, of, of assets and we need to know how to govern the ownership of these um, works that we have or these new assets. There's patent law as well for those who are into inventions, you know, um, registering all this um, software and technology that is being created from, uh, and which is also using software information. So that's a very important aspect as well. Law of evidence is a proof of facts in legal proceedings. Now legal proceedings are having many aspects referring to either digital assets or something in Web3. So those aspects are very important. There's also contract law. And this governs the making and enforcement of agreements. Many agreements are actually taking place online now. Um, if you buy an NFT from somebody in Cyprus, that's a smart contract. It's a contract between, to, between yourself and the person. And there's also the middle party, which is maybe like an open sea or a marketplace. So these are very you know, important aspects of the law that we need to revisit. There's also financial, banking, securities regulations, so, so many aspects. And we find that obviously regulation is moving at a much slower pace than the technology, but that doesn't um, remove the fact that it's actually important for us to have these um, laws in place. You can see AI is everywhere now, at least coming to four. And we, at least in Nigeria, we don't really have any um, artificial intelligence regulation. So, um, it's very important that we consider many of these legal issues when we're going into dealing with any kind of uh, blockchain technology or an offset of it. Um, as we're familiarizing ourselves with the emerging technologies, we also need to familiarize ourselves with the traditional laws or any new laws that are coming to fall with uh, the technology. Um, so just some key takeaways that uh, education about blockchain is very important, NFTs and metaverse and all what not. So we have a massive opportunity for growth and impact in Nigeria and Africa. 
any developing country because it's an opportunity to leapfrog. We all have this, everything that is happening in Web3 is happening on a global scale. So there is no disadvantage that we have in knowing the information. The only aspect, uh, the only aspect is, the only aspect is um, other, you know, uh, factors that we have that affect us like electricity, um, road access, having people in the rural areas have access to technology, all those preceding issues that we had previously. And so we need to begin to solve some of those in order to be able to fully tap into the advantages that with and blockchain generally offers us. We need to revamp our regulations and political and corporate leaders also need to be aware and also need to be educated. So that's just a little bit of what I wanted to add to the presentation that you've already done. And like I said, you covered a lot of uh, ground within the short space that you were given uh, and took a lot of topics um, for us to be able to, to go through. There's still a lot of information out there, lots more studying. Um, blockchain and Web3 is like a can of worms. They say once you once you drop down the rabbit hole, you just keep opening doors and discovering different things. So there are many other aspects that we can um, try and research about and use in our practical day-to-day. Web3 -day. and blockchain technology has so many use cases and I'm sure it's very useful for each and every one of us in our different work lives and whatever profession or career that we find ourselves to. So I, those are just the things that I just wanted to share with us today in addition to what you have already shared. So I guess I will just take any questions if we have any questions, otherwise um, we can move to the next. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ma. Um, thank you very much. We would have loved to continue listening to you, but I know you are in the office and um, you have to go very soon. But um, quickly before we jump into the question and answer session, um, I will encourage everybody to put on their videos. Let's just take a quick snapshot. I'm smiling of this session today. Thank you very much as you do so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, please, um, Team M, please, you can rename yourself for attendance purposes. Thank you very much. The person that's name is Tim M. Yeah, that handsome guy. Yeah, yeah, that guy that is smiling. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, quickly before I start um reading out the questions that were sent by um the mentees to our mentors for today. Um sadly, Miss Um Sarah Zade couldn't join us um maybe for some technical issues. So before I start reading out the question, um, I'll ask the, the mentees are allowed to ask their question directly. Um, any question that maybe pop up in your head and um, in the course of the presentation from either your group or from our mentor. So you can just raise your hand and I'll call on you to ask your question quickly. Um, okay, if we don't have that, question, I'll be reading out the questions for our main talk. The first question is on what are fungible crypto assets and are they regulated as security under Nigerian law? Why did you get that? Yes, I think what are digital assets? What are um, fungible, fungible? Fungible, okay. Fungible crypto assets. And are they regulated as security in under Nigerian law? Um, okay, for fungible assets, you know, we mentioned that there are different types of assets. We have the fungible, non-fungible, semi-fungible um, yeah. assets. But when it comes to securities laws, we do not have any specific laws that um, states whether an asset is a security or not. So for us in the space, what we usually use is the Howey test. There are many other tests, but the most popular is the Howey test, which they use in the US. And the Howey test asks quest four different questions. 
um, asking questions like, is there an investment of profit um, or anticipation of making a profit? Is it in a common enterprise? Is it by, derived by the efforts of others? If you have pooling of money together, and people are generally expecting to make profit from that um, fund, or they're expecting, um, or they're a group of people that run the organization. So that's the effort of others. Um, it generally is regarded as a security. Now, under the securities and exchange regulations that we have for virtual service asset providers, it does list in there that for every organization that is dealing with any form of digital assets, you need to prove that your asset is not a security. So it's an, a, a, a proof of elimination that the Nigerian uh, Securities Exchange Commission is using. So if you, are, if you have any form of digital assets, you need to um, go through that particular process to prove that you are not a security. And that will include having a legal opinion written, they'll need to see your white paper, they'll need to see the technology behind um, your digital asset just to make sure, you know, that it's not a security generally. So that's, that's what it is under the Nigerian law for now, until we have new regulation that actually does state um, what exactly um, security security entails when it comes to virtual assets. So that's the current um, position under the law in Nigeria. All right, thank you very much, Ma. Um, I'll quickly um, ask this next question. How safe is the use of cryptographic keys where there is presence of insider threats? Could you take that question again? Okay. Um, Say that um, how safe is the use of cryptographic keys where there is presence of insider threats? Well, with cryptographic keys, the truth is whoever owns the keys or has access to the private keys is the one that has access to the information. So if there's an insider, most likely the insider will have access to to the information. So let's give an example. Let's say you have your wallet. Your wallet, you have your public key, which is available. So you can give anybody your public key, which is your address and send it to anybody for them to send you funds. But you are the only one that has your private keys. But then the thing is your private keys now, they are, um, what do we call it? Best practices for how to keep your private keys. Like don't keep it on a computer system because somebody can hack that system. And once they hack the system, they have access to your keys, right? So because wh whichever way, if you keep it anywhere, anybody can have access to, they will have access to the information. Same for an organization as well. So if an organization has an account and they have private keys, Whoever has access to the private keys will have access to whatever asset or information is on there. So this, the issue now is how to keep the private keys or that particular um, um, asymmetrical cryptography private and secret from everybody else. So an organization will need to develop uh, strategies on how to do this. They probably need to hire professionals to help guide them on how exactly to ensure that nobody you know, gets access to that. They need to have security infrastructures or frameworks in place to make sure that their uh, private information is secure because anybody um, within that sphere can have information, uh, access to the information. So what some organizations do is, for those that have access to the information, they can create, um, kind of time stamps or time signatures for each person. So for example, if five of us on this call um, are part of a private organization and we have access to a private key, um, each of us, they can have uh, signatures attached to a private key. So for instance, as if it's Buki that signs on with the particular private key, they will know it's me because it has my signature on there. Mm -hmm. So to kind of have different access controls and even in the access control, kind of make sure that the signatures of each person is attached. So where there's a leak, 
you'll be able to easily trace it back to where the leak uh, actually happened, something like that. So those are some of the things that just need to be put in place by organizations, especially when dealing with um, cybersecurity and, and this kind of uh, cryptography or private information. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I don't know if um, any of the mentee has any question, any more question for our mentor. Okay, I think Cynthia Ibo has a question. Okay, Ma, thank you very much, Ma, for that explanation. But what I wanted to know is, um, like, inside that threat, I mean, those that can that have access to what goes on in the system, like, is it not illegal for, for them to issue out, like, tips to people, to outsiders, to other users who are not, like, Oh, okay, inside. so you mean for, like, security, definitely is a crime. Insider trading is a crime, either in the US, any, any part of the world, even it's in issue Nigeria. Out for mm -hmm. instance, if you are working with um, NGX, uh, let's, let's just even talk about regular Web2 um, stock market trading. There are certain things that you can't uh, divulge and you can't um, involve, other, involve yourself in or other parties in. So maybe, for instance, all the staff of NGX are not allowed to um, trade in certain aspects uh, because of the information that they have already. So now using that information that you have to either to give it to somebody else or to use it to your advantage is against the law. Um, so it, insider trading is a criminal offense and is punishable by the law. Almost in, I, I don't know any parts of the world that it is not. Um, so that's something that is against the law and something that um, insiders shouldn't be um, involved in. Now, we also have it for NFTs as well, because some of, I don't know if you heard of this popular case of, I think it was OpenSea, um, that one of the staff was charged for insider trading because he was using the information that he had on the NFTs. Um, and divulging that information to others and they were profiting from that information. So they were actually, you know, taken to court for that. Um, and, you know, generally all over the world, it's frowned upon and it's against the law. So it's, it's not allowed uh, and, and it's actually punishable. So they can be taken to court, they can be prosecuted and they can actually serve time for insider trading. All right. Um, all right thank, thank you, Mark. Thank you very much Ma, for answering the question. I don't know if we, any of us have any other question for her. Um, I think we've come to the end of the program for today. I'm very happy to always be here by 9 a.m. every week to come and gain um, a lot of knowledge from both our mentor and our mentee. And I also um, believe that we all, when we all come here, we, we don't go back empty headed. We actually fill our heads with lots of information, lots of um, inspiration on how to move forward on the blockchain um, and NFTs and metaverse technology in Nigeria. So thank you very much, Ma, once again, for joining us today. I'm very happy to see you here. Um, I think that will be all for today. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you very much, all the group members that um, worked you, on, on the, on the um, PowerPoint presentation. It was lovely. Um, I think you guys will be good there too. Okay, thank you very much and bye-bye. Have a nice day ahead. Bye-bye.